Double time. Let's add some spice to your solos. We've got a free PDF with all the exercises this week to get your technique burning, or at least smoldering. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace, and if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses, please do subscribe and be sure to hit the like button to heat up your double time licks. Now, for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the blues, studying the G7 chord, the mixolydian mode that goes with it, and last week, we added some chromatic alterations, some passing tones and surround tones borrowed from the blues scale and used them in a different context. Now, today, we're gonna to expand on that and do some faster technical exercises that apply those same notes we learned last week to some double time phrases. <laughs> Now in the comments below, make sure you let me know your favorite double time lick and which Cannonball Adderley album is it from. Now before we begin, make sure you download the exercises on the free PDF. I'll put a link right down below. Now double time phrases are a great way to add some energy and excitement to your solos and they're more accessible than you think. You may be thinking right now, oh, that's a really advanced thing, I'll never get there. But here's a jazz truth. Not everything we play in jazz is completely improvised including double time phrases. A lot of times, even your heroes had some ideas that were well worked out in advance, and you can hear that in their recordings, especially if you get some of the Verve master takes records where they'll have a soloist and they'll have alternate takes, you'll hear some of the nearly identical double time licks in multiple takes of the same solo. Sure, they may be spontaneous and altered in certain ways, but a lot of great players, including the masters, had a couple of double time licks in their back pocket they could pull out in the moment and really wow the audiences. We can do the same thing. Now over time, after you learn a few of these phrases, you'll start to combine them, alter them, expand upon them, and then it will be truly more improvised. But here's the conundrum. In order to play fast and spontaneously, we have to practice slow and methodically. And that's what we're working on in today's exercises. So all the phrases we have today, these double time licks, are over the G7 chord, and we've got a couple of bonus ones on the C7 chord as well. Before we get to the exercises, we need to talk about some fundamental things of how we practice them. So let's talk about the four S's of double time practice. And for my students, these are non-negotiable. We will practice these straight, slurred, slow, and segmented. So obvious to some, but not obvious to everyone, and that's okay if you're not doing this correctly yet. We don't want to practice with that kind of lilting swing rhythm when we're learning really anything, but especially not double time licks. We don't want to sound like this. Now that might be obvious to you, or it might not be, but we wanna make sure we're practicing it completely straight because as we speed it up and get to the actual tempo, it's gonna be essentially straight anyway with the swing inflection being added to the emphasis of our accents with air. The next S is slurred. We don't want to use articulation yet when we're learning the technique because articulation can mask inefficiencies of motion, of finger technique. So we wanna make sure we're doing it slurred and straight, getting everything even. Now the next two S's are slow and segmented. Slow, obviously, because to learn to play fast technique, we have to practice slow. Segmented, meaning we don't try to do the entire double time phrase at a time. We take each beat grouping individually. So we practice each beat landing on the next downbeat. We wanna make sure the next downbeat lands and clicks with the metronome. Now, for this demonstration, I actually have the metronome going on in my headphones. You can't hear it, but I assure you it is clicking. So we play each beat, we speed it up, then we add the next beat. Then we add subsequent beats and keep practice in a cumulative fashion, getting the line longer and longer. Now, for the sake of this demonstration, I've gone from slow to fast immediately. Ideally, of course, you're gonna to wanna to be slowly cranking up your metronome, click by click, as you work each beat and each little beat grouping faster and faster. <laughs> Now, 
Now, before we get to the slow, slurred, straight, segmented practice and start to ingrain this technique and start to form some neural pathways, we want to make sure we're using the optimal fingerings. So let's talk about a couple of fingerings, alternate fingerings, that are going to make these much more efficient. Now, a word of caution, I'm going to be using some close-up videos of my fingers to show you very clearly which alternate fingerings and key combinations I'm using. In general, I really, really do not recommend you watching videos where you watch someone finger the notes. They're a set of really poor training wheels that should come off immediately. They should never be added in the first place. The other big problem I see with those videos where they have the music with the little dot that follows along as they're fingering it, in order to show the fingering, they're doing exaggerated key motions to kind of let you clearly see what the key is. That's gonna be really bad for modeling technique and subconsciously giving you bad cues of what maybe technique should look like. When you're playing fast or any technique, if you're doing it correctly, there should be very little motion and it should be somewhat difficult to tell which keys you're actually hitting it. So let's take a look at number one. There is a D sharp which in the context of this line is a little bit tricky. So we're going to use an alternate fingering using our left side key number three. It's much more efficient in this context rather than using the E flat, adding all your fingers, you can just simply give it a little bump with your middle finger. Next up, a great opportunity to practice your side F sharp key. Take a look at number two. <laughs> Now that's a very efficient fingering and any horn made after 1904 should have that side key. You paid for it, start using it. It's a very efficient fingering, very smooth. You should use it and practice it whenever you can. Number three, the side B flat or A sharp. By the way, A sharp and B flat, we know they're the same note. The word for that is inharmonic. Say it with me, inharmonic. And now you can impress your friends at dinner parties. So for that note in this exercise, I recommend we use the side A sharp or B flat fingering. It's going to make the B, which lands on the beat, more clear when we articulate it. Also in the same exercise, number three, check out the C sharp. Now going from E to C sharp, lifting all the fingers. Very inefficient. So let's try just lifting our top two fingers on our left hand. So lifting the top two fingers creates the same note as C-sharp with no fingers. It's very efficient and easy to use. It also works from D to C-sharp. We'll see in future exercises lots of times to basically play D or E to C-sharp where we just lift those top two fingers. Very useful fingering. Now let's do some demonstrations of these exercises. For each of these phrases, I'm going to play them twice. You can play along if you'd like. And then after the first set of exercises, I'm going to do the same thing slow down. It's not exactly half time, but it is slower, so you can practice them slower and hear the articulations more clearly. <laughs> Slow 
Now, most of us can't learn these in a single day up to tempo. It may take you longer than a week. For some of us, it may take a month or longer. That's okay. Your journey is your journey. It doesn't matter the tempo or speed at which you move on your path to mastery. I'm here to support you wherever you are. So practice, have fun, have a most wonderful weekend after you practice. Go practice. <laughs>